Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and not only is my wife here, but I think she definitely qualifies as one of the ladies fighting for freedom that I talk about in my book. And taught me a lot, actually, about the history that is in included in the book. So I'm, I, I, this book focuses on three women and the books that they published in 1943 that basically kick-started the modern free market individualist movement in the United States. That was the God of the Machine, the Discovery of Freedom, and the Fountainhead. And their authors, Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, and Ayn Rand, were friends and colleagues who helped inspire each other's work and to resist the socialist trends that they thought were literally going to destroy the world. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that they were women, uh, but how that fact influenced their work is a bit of a complicated story because none of them viewed themselves as feminists, at, with the possible exception of Rose Wilder Lane. Now, over the weekend, I was trying to decide how to explain this, and on Sunday, Christina and I went to see the movie Titanic. <laughs> it's been 25 years since the movie came out, so they've re-released it for the anniversary. And this is a scene from, the, this is the, the very, toward the end of the movie. This is a scene toward the end here. Oh, come back and hit, scroll up and hit the play button there in the center if you can. Ah, it's not working. Okay. Well, in the scene, uh, Rose, who's on the deck of the Carpathia, having been rescued from the Titanic, enters New York Harbor, and she looks up at the Statue of Liberty. Now, the Statue of Liberty was completed in 1886, and that was the same year that Isabel Patterson and Rose Wilder Lane were born. They were both born poor in log cabins on America's western frontier. And both would have been about 25 years old when the Titanic sank in 1912, which is roughly the same age that Kate Winslet was when she made the movie, just a little bit older. Now, their generation witnessed the most dramatic transformations in the history of the human race. Both of them were born at the end of America's pioneer era into a world that was lit by fire and operated on steam power. They were teenagers when they saw their first light bulbs. They were 34 years old when women got the right to vote, which would have been eight years after the Titanic sank. Now, women have been already making dramatic strides forward by that time, thanks to what's called the New Woman Movement. The New Woman was an ideal of femininity, a new modern ideal of femininity that prized education, physical fitness, and economic independence. In 1912, the same year that the Titanic sank, the artist Charles Dana Gibson produced this image, which is called The Reason Dinner Was Late, which perfectly captures what was happening all across America as women sought new ways of living that would give them opportunity and undertake interesting occupations without sacrificing their femininity. And the time was right because America was experiencing these astonishing transformations in technologies, right? Lane and Patterson witnessed the expansion of the nation's railroad network to these far-off frontier villages like Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> Actually, the, fir the railroad arrived here in Phoenix in 1887 when they were one year old. They were 17 when the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. But as Isabel Patterson later said, quote, nobody here got much excited about the invention of the airplane at the time, not because they didn't care, but because their attitude was, of course people could fly. In this country at that time, anyone could do anything. The sky was no limit. In fact, in 1912, the same year as the Titanic, Patterson herself rode in a rickety airplane and set what was then the world altitude record of 5,300 feet. She later said aviation was, quote, a lot more fun in the early days when you sat on a six-inch strip of matchboard and held onto a wire strut and looked down past your toes at nothing but the earth. <laughs> a few years after that, she got a job with the sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who's best remembered today for carving Mount Rushmore. This is a portrait of her drawn by Borglum. Borglum was a big, bold personality who did not like to be bossed around. He was commissioned to carve a monument to the Confederate generals on the side of Stone Mountain in Georgia. But the project became a huge pain in the neck 
because of the interference of politicians and the nonprofit that hired him. And it became such a problem that he finally lost his temper. He smashed the plaster miniatures of his artwork and threw them off the top of the mountain and quit. The work was completed by a different artist. Does that sound a little familiar to those of you who have read The Fountainhead? (laughs) Now, Borglum was just one example of the kind of audacious individualist who marked pre-World War I America. For the rest of her life, Patterson would say, she came from a time when men were men. In 1924, she moved to New York City and began working at the Herald Tribune, where she wrote a weekly column called Turns with a Bookworm which consisted of book reviews and gossip about the publishing industry, and she wrote it every week for a quarter century, in addition to her novels, her magazine articles, her separate book reviews, and so forth. In 1926, she reviewed a novel by an up-and-coming writer named Rose Wilder Lane. Now, Rose was an independent Western woman. She was the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, and she later became the secret co-author of the Little House on the Prairie novels with her mother. But the reality was that she hated the prairie. She hated it so much she could not wait to get away from it. As soon as she was old enough, she moved to Kansas City to work as a telegraph operator. And then in 1908, she moved to California and got a job working at the San Francisco Bulletin. And she considered herself a socialist at the time, even a communist. She never really understood the economics behind socialism, but she was drawn to its rhetoric of sexual equality and freedom. Socialism claims to be the wave of the future, right? It would sweep away all the traditional hierarchies and all the the, the notion that a woman's place is in the home and everything and open the doors of creativity and opportunity for women. As the Arizona pioneer Lida Parse Robinson said in Socialist Woman magazine in 1908, socialism is feminism. And then came World War I. Because it was so overshadowed by the horrors that came afterwards, we sort of forget how traumatic World War I really was. Not only were 20 million people killed, but Americans suffered a snuffing out of their personal freedoms like nothing they'd ever experienced before. Military conscription was instituted and nearly 3 million Americans were forced into military service. Freedom of speech was sharply restricted under the Sedition Act of 1917, which made it a crime to criticize the war effort. The nation's industries and food supply were taken over by the federal government, which began a nationwide rationing program under the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover. But Hoover didn't like to call it rationing. He preferred to claim that people were voluntarily sacrificing for the good of the country by adopting things like meatless Mondays. Abroad, the war brought about two developments that would haunt the rest of the century, the German Revolution of 1918, which led to the establishment of the Weimar Republic, and the resentments over that would lead to the rise of Hitler. And Russia was so devastated by the war that it experienced a revolution that put Vladimir Lenin in charge of the country. But Lane wanted to see things for herself. So in 1920, she traveled to Paris, and from there on to Albania, Armenia, and Georgia, where she reported firsthand on the confiscation of grain and the conscription and genocide of the people by the newly proclaimed Soviet Union. The experience scared the socialism right out of her. She returned to the United States in 1925 and plunged into reading about freedom, particularly the history of America. And among the victims of this new communist regime was the third character in our story, Ayn Rand. She was born in 1905 in St. Petersburg, which was the literary capital of Russia. Her family was very interested in literature. One of Rand's sisters was even nicknamed Nora after the main character of Henrik Ibsen's play A Doll's House, which is a milestone in the history of feminism. Rand's family suffered terribly under the Bolsheviks, but she was able to complete college and graduated in 1924, just when Lane was witnessing the Soviet atrocities in the South. Rand already hated communism, and she knew she could not survive in Russia. She wanted to go to Hollywood to work in the movie industry. So through family connections, her parents were able to arrange for her to travel to the United States. And in 1926, she took a ship to New York, and after a brief stay in Chicago, went on to California. She was 21 years old at the time. Now, she arrived in the midst of a huge cultural upheaval, one that was focused primarily in the literary world. And this was also the work of a woman, but in this case, a fictional woman. 
In 1920, Sinclair Lewis published the novel Main Street, which is probably the most important work of American literature after Huckleberry Finn. It's about a woman named Carol Kennicott, who longs for a life of meaning and significance, but finds instead that the small town in which she lives smothers any dream of beauty or achievement. By the way, this slide here is from a silent film adaptation of Main Street by Warner Brothers, which has been lost. It was destroyed, so the film no longer exists. The woman here is, the actress is Florence Vidor. Her husband, uh, would let, King Vidor, would later direct the film version of The Fountainhead. So, uh, Lewis, per, in, in Main Street, portrays American suburban life as this soul-destroying place of conformity and dreariness. Here's how he describes middle America in the book. It is an unimaginatively standardized background, a sluggishness of speech and manners, a rigid ruling of the spirit by the desire to appear respectable. It is the contentment of the quiet dead who are scornful of the living for their restless walking. It is negation canonized as a positive virtue. It is the prohibition of happiness. It is slavery self-sought and self-defended. It is dullness made God. That's what he thought of bourgeois America. Lewis's novel was part of a trend called The Revolt from the Village, which made war against bourgeois life. And Carol Kennicott tries everything she can think of to escape the stifling conformity and ordinariness of Gopher Prairie, Minnesota. But nobody understands her. When she tries to organize a community theater group, the neighbors refuse to put real effort into it because they don't think it's fun. And she says, I wonder if you can understand the fun of making a beautiful thing, the pride and satisfaction of it, and the holiness. But it's no use, and she finally gives up. Patterson, Lane, and Rand were all influenced by this revolt from the village movement. For instance, when Lane was a reporter in Paris in 1920, she befriended and may have become lovers with Dorothy Thompson, who later married Sinclair Lewis in 1928. In fact, Lane babysat for them when they went to Europe to get Lewis's Nobel Prize for Literature. Patterson had known Lewis for years before Main Street appeared. She first met him when he was working as an editor in 1912 and rejected one of her novels. But Lewis's strongest influence was on Ayn Rand. She had felt that she had escaped from a village that was far worse than Gopher Gopher Prairie, Minnesota. In her autobiographical novel, We the Living, she has a character say that the Soviet Union looks like a monster from a distance, but when you get up close, you see it's made up of a million tiny cockroaches packed on top of each other. (laughs) Then the stock market crashed in 1929. There had been economic downturns before, of course, but in those cases, the government had let private businesses change their practices, reduce staffing, hire new people, and take steps to fix the problem. But this time, the progressive president, Herbert Hoover, decided on a different path. He thought it was essential to maintain or stabilize prices, which meant the government should force businesses to keep spending and prevent them from charging less for their goods and services. Surprisingly enough, that didn't work. And when Hoover ran for re-election, his challenger accused him of spending too much money and, quote, piling bureau on bureau, commission upon commission. That his opponent promised to, quote, reduce the size of the current federal government's operations by 25% and put an end to radical and unorthodox economic theories, end quote. That was, of course, Franklin Roosevelt. It's hard today for us to appreciate that when Roosevelt was elected, the idea of dictatorship was really fashionable in the United States at that time. Mussolini, especially, was viewed as a success story because he had turned around the Italian economy and he overcame the gridlock of parliamentary democracy, right? Many Americans hoped Roosevelt would do the same thing. William Randolph Hearst even paid to produce a movie called Gabriel Over the White House, which portrayed God himself instructing the new president to declare himself dictator execute his political enemies, and bring peace and prosperity to America. Congress gave Roosevelt immense power to unilaterally control banks, dictate the value of the dollar, to tell the nation's farms and factories what they could produce and what they could charge and who they could hire. The new Federal Communications Act gave Roosevelt virtually total control over what was aired on the nation's radio stations. And because the government 
had hired so many people onto the taxpayers' payroll, there was very little political opposition. Why would you oppose Roosevelt when he was signing your paycheck? All of this horrified Isabel Patterson. She wrote that economic planners like Roosevelt never ask themselves how wealth comes to be created in the first place. They just take it as a fact of nature and go about redistributing it. In an article that criticized a book by a socialist writer, she said, quote, He assumes as his setup a self-existent economy of plenty. There is no such thing. That potential plenty depends entirely upon a minority of people being allowed to function. We do not mean a class, but a certain type of mind. Businessmen and farmers and foremen and housewives, the people who will always somehow get things done, get some practical result from whatever material is at hand. They are self-starters, and their particular function is to hold everything together. A business may be so admirably organized that it looks like it would run itself, as if you could take, but if you took one or two men out who keep it running and put in some bureaucrat who knows all of the graphs and charts, the business will go to pieces. And in an effort to regulate everything, those people may easily be eliminated. Bureaucracy smothers them, end quote. Lane was also shocked by Roosevelt's schemes, especially the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which forced farmers to destroy their crops in order to keep the prices high and seized their land in order to force them to move to places where the government thought they ought to live. None of the farmers, Lane said, wanted to be rehabilitated. Patterson was even more horrified by the way that America's industrial leaders went along with it. They seemed to buy into socialism. Not only did they refuse to stand up for themselves, but they hopped on the Roosevelt bandwagon. Or worse, millionaire Frederick Vanderbilt Field and Vincent Astor were major donors to socialist magazines such as Today and The New Masses. In 1934, the Rockefeller family actually hired the communist Diego Rivera to paint the central mural at the newly built Rockefeller Center. Predictably enough, Rivera produced this, Mankind at the Crossroads. Notice the portrait of Vladimir Lenin rescuing the workers here on the right. In the original version, it had uh, Rockefeller Sr., John Rockefeller Sr. over here, spreading sexually transmitted disease germs. That's what these are. Uh, His son, Nelson, had it jackhammered out of the wall at Rockefeller Center. That year, that same year, Patterson published her novel, The Golden Vanity, which is a satire on the New Deal. It centers around the wealthy Siddall family, and particularly the elderly Charlotte Siddall, whose husband, John, died on the Titanic. Now their son Arthur is spending the family fortune to subsidize socialist magazines and her financial advisors are spending money on get-rich-quick schemes such as the construction of Rockefeller Center for which there was no market demand. In the novel's climax, Charlotte rushes to the home of an old friend, the only other member of her generation who's still alive, hoping he can explain this and she finds that he's sitting in a wheelchair senile, clutching silver dollars and muttering to himself, there's no more money, there's no more money. That same year, Lane traveled throughout the Midwest to observe the disastrous consequences of Roosevelt's agricultural schemes, and the result was this remarkable little book called Give Me Liberty. Although Lane had no training in economics, her book anticipated many of the ideas of later free market thinkers, such as Friedrich Hayek or Ludwig von Mises, in arguing that government simply cannot plan out an economy. Trying to do so inevitably requires controlling all of individual life. For example, She used soap as her example. If government tries to dictate how much businesses can charge for soap, that will necessarily require them to dictate how much soap people use. And that will inevitably require the government to dictate how often people can bathe. Now that might sound like a silly example, but in fact the regulation of the production of soap has been a major preoccupation of authoritarian governments over the, over the years. King Charles I in the 17th century restricted the production of, and sale of soap, which required his government to create a soap police that went around to prohibit bootleg soap. And obviously soap production was a major concern in the Soviet Union where getting soap was a very difficult task. Rand, of course, was horrified at the same time, by what was happening to her adopted home country. When Roosevelt announced that he was going to run for a third term, she feared that he might become president for life, which, of course, he did. She decided, quote, it's now or never for capitalism, and so she laid aside work on the fountainhead that she was writing at the time 
to work for his opponent, Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie obviously lost, and Rand decided that the reason why was because America didn't have an intellectual movement for freedom. So she started trying to recruit people to join in an intellectual movement for freedom, and one of the people she invited was Isabel Patterson. And Patterson said no. <laughs> she refused to join any groups. But she wanted to meet Rand, and so they met at Patterson's office at the Herald Tribune, and pretty soon they became friends, and they were staying up late night talking about philosophy and politics and literature and history. Rand's name began appearing in Patterson's column. This cartoon here is supposed to be depicting Ayn Rand dragging Patterson across the street in the middle of Manhattan traffic. These, let's go back to the last little slide. The, these drawings, nobody really knows who did these drawings in Patterson's column, um, but, and obviously this is a man. It's probably John Chamberlain, who was a young columnist at that time and a friend of both Patterson and Lane. Uh, in 1943, as I said, they all published their books. One intriguing thing about them is that their titles are all synonyms. In the 1950s, Lane authorized a republication of the discovery of freedom, and it was retitled The Mainspring of Human Progress, which is the same thing as the god of the machine, and that means the same thing as the fountainhead. What is that thing? It's the source of wealth and creativity. I mentioned how Patterson objected to the way socialists just assume that wealth somehow magically comes about and then they just redistribute it, right? They never talk about how wealth is created in the first place. The common theme of all of these books is the element of individual creativity, its sanctity and its role in, as the source of all innovation. Now, I want to get back to this question about how their ideas were affected by being women. I started out by mentioning the revolt from the village movement, like Sinclair Lewis and all that which rejected the cheap consumerism of American culture. The Depression and World War II forced Americans to move away from the revolt toward a deeper appreciation of American values. And writers began to celebrate American history and culture in reaction against fascism that we were fighting on the battlefield. The most obvious example of that is the rise of the frontier novel, novels about pioneers struggling to survive on the prairie. Rose Wilder Lane, obviously, was one of the leaders of that movement with her Little House on the Prairie novels that she wrote with her mother. And, but she also wrote a book in 1933 called Let the Hurricane Roar, her first frontier novel, which features how this affected women. It's based on her grandmother, and it, it features a, a character living alone on the American frontier. She was particularly interested in how women experience the American opportunity of freedom. She followed that book, in 1938, with a book called Free Land, which was written in reaction to people who complained that previous generations had things easy because the, they got free land under the Homestead Act, and she wanted to prove to them that the land was not free. People had to work their tails off for that land. Patterson had a similar view. She thought socialism and fascism and the New Deal were all products of a crisis of masculinity. She wrote in her column that modern men were experiencing a sense of uncertainty that she had never noticed before the Depression. Men naturally needed a sense of challenge and a mastery of the material world through intelligence, she said. And back in the old days, they did that through military valor, but now that was no longer considered worthy. But the only alternative was entrepreneurialism, running a business, and that was treated as vulgar. And so as a result, she said, quote, the most able and intelligent men are the least heard in our time. And the incompetent and unintelligent grab dictatorships and start drilling for war as a means of aggrandizing their egos. She called the New Deal, quote, a mama's boy economic program with a kind of maternal government taking care of everybody out of an inexhaustible income drawn from mysterious sources. Rand obviously agreed with that. In The Fountainhead, she portrayed her ideal man as one who is concerned, first and foremost, with conquering nature instead of ruling over other people. But of course, she did not confine this to women. She thought individualism was the basis of any true feminism. In Atlas Shrugged, which is her novel about the Great Depression, the main character is a woman who runs a railroad. And Rand's only comment on this in the thousand-page novel is, quote, Dagny was 15 when it occurred to her for the first time that women do not run railroads and people might object. To hell with that, she thought, and never worried about it again. Atlas Shrugged, as I said, was Rand's novel about the Depression, just like Patterson's novel about the Depression was The Golden Vanity, and Lane's was Free Land. And Atlas Shrugged reflects the influence of Patterson, Rand's mentor. 
in a way that brings us back to the Titanic that I started with. The pervasive tone of Patterson's novels is this sense of a vanished world. She felt like the America she had known when she was young, a land of big personalities like Borglum and huge inventions like the airplane, was being strangled by the bureaucracy and taxation of the New Deal. In her 1933 novel, Never Ask the End, a character who represents Patterson herself reminisces about her childhood on America's frontier and says, quote, America was a wild land. It had never been plowed or fenced. She thought, we belong to a sunken continent, lost Atlantis, submerged under the westward tide of the peoples of the world. Our little towns are drowned too. One used to come to the end of a boardwalk and step off upon virgin sod, after us, nobody will know what it was like, end quote. Notice the reference to Atlantis. The next year, the Golden Vanity, a character who again represents Patterson, reflects on how the 30s have transformed America. Quote, we'll never touch our shore again, she says. That landfall is lost forever. In fact, the title, The Golden Vanity, comes from an English folk song about a shipwreck. In Patterson's final novel, If It Prove Fair Weather, the main character, who yet again represents Patterson, thinks about her own childhood on the frontier and says, it's sunk without a trace. Now, Patterson was fascinated by the legend of Atlantis. She had a personal theory, in fact, that there really had been an Atlantis and that it was in North America. In fact, she thought it was the American West. She mentioned it in many of her writings. Now, of course, if you've read Atlas Shrugged, you know that she used, Rand uses the legend of Atlantis as the name of the place where the world's capitalists go and hide when they go on strike. And the first time that the word Atlantis is mentioned in the novel is at a party when a woman approaches Dagny Taggart and says that she actually knew Atlantis. She knew somebody who had been to Atlantis. A distant relative of hers had actually visited the place. And when Dagny doesn't believe her, the woman loses her temper and storms away. That is a cameo of Isabel Patterson in Atlas Shrugged. In October 1943, when Rand was just starting to work on Atlas Shrugged, which she was then calling The Strike, Patterson sent her a letter which included a quote from a book about philosophy. The book was talking about the Muslim theologian Averroes, who is considered one of the last great thinkers of the Islamic Golden Age, which ended around 1200 AD. Here's the quotation from the book. It's hard to read because this is how Patterson's no letters all look, riddled with typos and and then she just snapped him out on her typewriter, right? Uh, quote, The happy few whom God has endowed with a philosophical mind should content themselves with a solitary possession of rational truth. Patterson went on to say that doesn't that show that Averroes planned to go on strike? Rand replied, Now I know that I will have to write the strike. You'll push me to it. I suspect that Rose Wilder Lane, who was very interested in Muslim history, helped Patterson to learn about the end of the Islamic Golden Age and the cause of that collapse, and that Patterson then passed that idea on to Rand, who of course was already familiar with how civilizations collapse since she had lived in the Soviet Union. Neither Lane nor Rand, however, thought that America was going to sink without a trace. Lane ends her book, The Discovery of Freedom, which I, I have right here, with a, a, a note of optimism. Here's the last paragraph of the book. Win this war? Of course Americans will win this war. This is only a war. There is more than that. Five generations of Americans will have, or have led the revolution, and the time is coming when Americans will set the whole world free. In The Fountainhead, Rand was more succinct. Howard Rourke simply says, Mankind will never destroy itself, nor should it think of itself as destroyed. If humanity ever does prevail against the forces arrayed against freedom, it will owe a lot to these three women. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions. Yes? 